Zvezda na Dode from the Nasal D Institute in Russia um, cannot be with us today. Um, and since we are not certain of the quality of the internet right now, as uh, Vesda has suggested that we record, or she will record the paper in advance, and we will present it to you now on video, with the hope that Vesda would be able to, to join us for the Q&A later. So I think Vesda is online and listening to us. So we are sending you warm wishes from uh, Manhattan. And thank you very much for your paper. There's the daughter, please. Greeting to all participants of the conference. Let me express my gratitude for the invitation and the opportunity to speak in this scientific forum under the circumstance. Uh, my paper today on honorary ropes and belts of submission in Mongolian imperial culture. My presentation is part of a special chapter in a forthcoming monograph uh, of the clothing of the nomads of the Mongol Empire. Honorific clothing are uh, often referred to in the literature as the ropes of honor. As a subject of study among cultures has many aspects. The composition of the honorific dress, its distinctive qualities, the status of person presented with such gifts, the reasons for presentation, the place of manufacture, storage, and distribution of such dress, the semantic function of honorific robes, and finally, the use of such dress in the ceremonial reception of the foreign embassy. These and other questions have been addressed to some uh, extant in the following publications, Robes and Honor 2001 and Robes of Honor 2003, both edited by Stuart Gordon. My monograph takes in-depth look at the process and meaning of this phenomenon as practiced by the Mongol Empire. Um, at the center of the discourse of this presentation surrounding honorific clothing is the custom of prestigious distribution practiced in societies which are based on the supreme authority of the ruler. In external relations with nominally autonomous possessions, the gift of luxurious clothing is an extension of the power of the ruler. The acquisition of honorific clothing is an acknowledgement and acceptance of that power by the recipient. In the internal structure of society, a dress of honor symbolizes the establishment of social ties and the formation of a hierarchy. These provisions are typical of the Mongols, who, mastering a foreign cultural space, appropriate its symbols and understood the semantic squad embedded in honorific robing. In my presentation, I would like to focus on two aspects of Mongolian honorary dress in their system of imperial symbology. The rope of honor as a clearly understood expression of power and the belt as a symbol of submissiveness. This reflected the political pragmatic of Mongol imperial expansion, expressed in short remark attributed to the Kulaguit minister of state, Rashid al-Din, to Khan Kulagu. I am conqueror for enemies, but a ruler for the humble. The list of honorific attire in medieval Arabic and Persian texts include undergarment, various types of outer robes, headdresses, belts, 
and adornment. However, outer robes and belts appear as honorary clothes much more often than other elements of the costume, which apparently is due to their special semantic content. The clothes included in the set of robes of honor are mentioned in written sources by a variety of uh, descriptors, always the connotation of power. Among them are royal clothes, Padishah's robe, imperial brocade cloth, royal cloth, Genghis Khan robe, Kaba of administration, wizard clothes, all of which unequivocally point to a robe as a symbol of power. The connection between clothes and power traceable in written sources is quite clear. In the culture and political space of the East, an honorary robe was traditionally regarded as the equivalent of a declaration of the possession of a state. Such a sign, for example, was given to Persian military leaders sent to serve in the eastern region of the North Caucasus to ensure the security of the northern borders of Persia from nomadic rights. The Persian historian Hamza Isfahani in 1962 recorded in the history of the ruling Persian dynasties that Shah Kasrof Anushirvan in the 6th century as a sign of his endowing the honor with power and property rights handed to each new king of the mountain, silk clothing depicting a particular animal and granted an appropriated title. For example, the king of camels, the king of lions, the king of elephants, the king of light colored horses. The received ropes depicting different animals indicate their autonomous management of protected lands, which became the property of military leaders who passed them on by in inheritance. Fabric with animal imagery has been preserved in the medieval burial ground on the North Caucasus. Manifested in images of animals on clothing, the titles of the rulers on the North Caucasus were preserved there for a long time and even became the names of specific principalities. Among the numerous examples of the use of a rope as a symbol of power, there is a, presid a president not only described, but also illustrated in the sources of the 14th century. In the miniature from the chronicle of Rashid al-Din, Jami al-Tavarik, the ruler of the Central Asian state of the Ghaznavids, Mahmoud Ghazni, in the presence of his subject, put on a rope sent to him by the Caliph of Baghdad. About this event, which occurred in 988, uh, Fazullah Nami al Astrabadi wrote that this rope of honor was of great value to the Sultan. However, the actual fabric from which the rope was constructed remains a mystery. The rope depicted in miniature from the first uh, quarter of the 14th century is associated with the striped fabrics woven in Egyptian workshops at the end of the 13th century. Such fabrics have been found in the medieval cemeteries of Mamluk, Egypt, and Christian Nubia. The close textile analogies are a fragment of a silk tunic and trousers, as well as children's clothing made of striped silk, which are now in the Department of Decorative and Applied Arts of the Victoria and Albert Museum. A natural uh, question arises. 
could a royal gift sent by one ruler to another to be, uh, be made of fabric available to the population of medieval Egypt. This miniature shows that although the real value of such fabrics woven this gold thread was definitely high, the symbolic function of the rope associated with the person and power of donor prevailed over its material value. In the system of political symbols of the Mongol Empire, a special emphasis was placed on the rope and belt associated with the person of the ruler. For example, Genghis Khan's presentation of his personal rope and belt with the distinguishing characteristic were supposed to demonstrate the newly elevated social status of the Uyghur Idus intention to enter the service of the Mongol as described in uh, secret history. Quotation, if through your favor or Genghis Khan, I were to obtain but a ring from your gold belt, but a thread from your Christmas court, I will become your fifth son and will serve you. There is no doubt that the clothing associated with the name of Chinggis Khan was both symbolic and at the same time was a visual manifestation of the ruler's persona. That is, a personal robe of the ruler was directly associated with the persona and therefore with his charisma and power. Rashid al-Din reinforced the Mongolian idea regarding the connection between the honorary robe and the actual person of the supreme ruler in his description about the assumption of a new position by Masud Be. Quotation. When he arrived at the service of Abaga Khan, he was then dressed in the kaftan of Chinggis Khan set above all the emir except for Elik Nayon. In another example in the literature, Toktimur bestowed a rope from his own shoulders to his commander Bigzilan in native alliance. And in the third example, the Mongolian Khan Mingutimur dressed his son-in-law, the Russian prince Fyodor Rostislavovich Chorny in his personal garment. This act is recorded in the Mazurian Chronicle, a document compiled in the last quarter of the 17th century. Khan Mingutimu dressed his son-in-law in his purple vestments. These examples, of which there are so more, demonstrate that the projection of authority onto the clothing of the ruler, which is reflected in the secret history of the Mongols, is the main iconic function of the Mongolian robe. Along with the gift of royal robe, royal charisma spread to the recipient, whose own power was in turn strengthened. Therefore, reference to robes of honor in written sources quite often correlated with information about the ruler empowering a person through a gift of the ruler's own clothing. The inclusion of the uh, representat uh, representative of the elite on the conquered territories, Rus, Armenia, Georgia, Persia, etc., into the system of Mongolian power, assumed that they dress in Mongolian costume, which is reflected in reliefs found in Kubachi, Dagestan, North Caucasus, Armenia, and the Seljuk reliefs surviving in Konya, Tokyo. A decree of Sultan Sanjar in uh, 12th century stated that royal attire, along with other attributes of power, were the motto, distinguished feature, and adornment of Siphalasar, uh, heroes and rulers of the outskirts. 
The Mongol Khans, in their view of political relation with the world, saw themselves as at the center of the lands granted to them by the power of the internal sky. Beginning from where the sun rises and ending where it sets. Under these conditions, the presentation of robes directly related to the persona of the ruler is seen as a symbolic distribution of power from the center to the periphery and the subordination of the periphery to the center. According to written sources, it is known that the set of honorary clause change depending on the status of the recipient. List of gifts were compiled uh, in strict accordance with the composition of the persons to whom they were intended. So far, according to the available brief and scattered reports, it is not possible to carry out of complete gradation of the quality of the rope handed over to representative of different categories of the population. However, the definition moment, oh, sorry. However, the defining moment in the structuring of Mongolian society was the place of person in the queue for receiving the highest gifts. Medieval authors pay special attention to this circumstance. Indicative in this respect are the testimonies of Rashid al-Din. He said that Ghazan Khan during the Kurultai in Ujjan in July 1300 distributed 20,000 pieces of clothing, 50 belts adorned with precious stones, 300 golden belts, and so on. The author emphasizes that the Khan called each recipient one by one and ordered everyone to take their share in his presence. In this way, he distributed the goods for 10 or 11 days. It is obvious that the sum were honored with the attention of the Khan on the first and others on the last day of the ceremony. According to Rashid al-Din, the main principle of distribution was the correspondence to two levels of the Mongolian hierarchy, one, one of which was the Chinggisid family, on the other the rest of the subject of the state. Giovanni described in more detail the hierarchy of receiving a white cloth at the Kurultai of uh, 1246, which confirmed the accession of Guyuk, the first to receive their share of the princes and princesses that were present on the race lynched of the Chinggis Khan as also of their servants and attendants, noble and base, gray buried and suckling. And then in due order, the Noyans, the commander of two men, thousands, hundreds, and tens, according to the census, the sultans, Malik, scrolls, officials, and their dependents. Thus, Honorary cloth in the context of state ritual, which reflected the order and social ranking of the recipient, made visual the imperial hierarchy. The public presentation of robes of honor in accordance with the strict hierarchy of presenting subject at Kuril ties provided an information space in which the person bestowed with the honorary robe became widely known. The symbolism of honorary clothing embedded in the system of power symbols of the Mongol Empire became firmly established in the political culture of the peoples drawn into the orbit of the Mongol conquest for a long time. In the Eastern cultural context, the stability of the functioning of the 
institution of honorary robbing and the pre uh, preservation of its symbolic function was determined by constant reproduction over a long period. In the system of political symbols of Russian statehood, Mongolian heritage was represented by fur coat from the master's shoulder, which functioned in various material incarnations until the beginning of the 10th century. The kaftan as a specific insignia was granted from the cabinet of his imperial majesty at the personal uh, discretion of the sovereign emperor or at the suggestion of the authorities to peasants, artisans, foreigners, and in general person of taxable estates. To reinforce their status, persons westward of Kaftan from the Tsar were exempted from corporal punishment. In conclusion, I would like to mention one more fact reflected in written sources and which seems to have analogies in our recent archaeological finds. Specifically in the summer, of uh, 2021 in the territory of the Golden Gort city of Uvek, a woman's robe made of Egyptian striped silk cut in the Mongolian style was found. On the inside of the lining fabric, an imprint of seal has been preserved, which may indicate either a private weaving workshop or the state's storehouse from which diplomatic gifts were issued. Medieval authors testified that honorary clothes intended for public distribution were kept in the Khan's treasures from which some garment were stolen and sold. Uh, the theft was massive, as pointed out by Rashid al Din. According to him, is ten, uh, eight tenths of go uh, government valuables disappeared every year. To combat theft, Gazan Khan ordered the marking of clothing that entered the state treasures. The sovereign ordered that the certain brand be made and every garment that is delivered to the treasury is immediately branded with this brand so that it cannot be replaced and the transferred money or cloth must be handed over immediately with the official seal it appears that the unremarkable plain with lining on the Uvek find has much less reason to be marked than the rope itself. Perhaps in the future, deciphering the image of the seal of the rope from Uvek will reveal the secret of its entry into the territory of the Golden Horde. Unlike the rope, which symbolized the delegation of power, the belt in the written of Muslim authors is associated with the idea of service. Leaving aside the semantic of the belt in Western culture, which is inextric inextricably linked with weapons and therefore with the strength and power of the owner. Let us focus on Islamic written sources where information about belts is accompanied by the corresponding dis description. Belt of humility and loyalty, belt of obedience, belt of service, belt of obedience and devotion. The semantic meaning of the belt in Islamic culture is expressed in the content of the medieval poem, Blessed Knowledge, 
created in the 11th century by the Southern Asian poet and thinker Yusuf Balasagunsky. Well, literally, the belt of service means the entry of the hero of Dulmish into the service of the elite Kuntagdi. And putting on the belt of service from now on, Ogdulmish gave the leaders affairs permanent, permanent supervision. The utilitarian function of the belt associated with the need to fasten the front edges of the rope in the absence of tile or fasteners, determined its uh, pragmatic content in cloth with loose front edges it is impossible or pretty difficult to carry out actions that require movement in labor military or other activities in islamic culture several utilitarian, utilitarian functions of the textile belt i mean are a kind of sash in the costume complex are determined by the religious basis that regulated the frequency of Islamic rituals. The belt was used as a towel after ritual washing before prayer, as a prayer rug. It was also a sign of grief in a mourning costume. It was tied over cloth by close uh, relative of the deceased. Um, if the turban made up one element of the shroud, then the textile belt wrapped around the corpse was symbolically the second piece of the burial cloth. Religious ideology became the basis of the semantic connection of the belt with the ethical and moralistic idea of Islam about the believer's readiness to serve their Almighty, which is clearly seen in the writing of Muslim authors. It is obvious that the from obedience to the Almighty followed the idea of serving the master. The symbolism of the belt as a sign expressing read, um, readiness for service and action was expressed and metaphor girt up for service. In Islamic culture, this formula is polysemantic. It expresses a person's readiness for religious, politics, political, professional service, um, embodied uh, in the figurative expression of Nizami from the poem Iskander Namem. Such metaphors project Muslim uh, central ideology on the Mongolian reality. In practice, at the Mongolian court, a belt tied by a person showed readiness to uh, perform official duties. According to Juvaini, at the feast of Guyuk's coronation, the service first uh, girded their loins by tying their belts and then began to pass around the bolo with kumis and all kinds of pine. However, the emphasis should be on something else. The metaphorical nature of the belt, its semantic content as a sign of service in written sources, receive particularization in pictorial mon monument on which representatives of local power elites who were the pens vassals of the Mongol Khans are presented dressed in Mongolian costume, in which in instruction to his son Kenya, Jalal al-Din Rashid al-Din writes, so if the enemy is stupid and ignorant, consider him low and insignificant. But if he is smart and wise, take possession of his thoughts. If you do this, the enemy who will turn his enmity into friendship and hostility into friendliness. Tie a belt of service around the waist of his soul. 
and will observe the duty of obedience to orders. In accordance with this attitude, Rashid al-Din proposed to act against the detachments of rebels who settled on the tops of the mountains and on the slopes of the hills of Sansan, Abkhazia, and Trebzon, and put on all of them a belt of obedience and devotion. The fact that the semantic function of the Mongolian belt was formed under the influence of Muslim ideology does not mean that it was filled with their religious content. As a result of their pragmatic selection from the cultivated cultural space of conquered peoples, the Mongols appropriated what corresponded to their own benefit. The Islamic idea of submission embodied in the semantic of the belt thus corresponded to Mongol imperial expansion. In the state holidays of the Mongolian elite, a special place was occupied by the ritual of removing the head and throwing a belt around the neck, performed by all participants in solemn ceremonies. As a rule, the untying of the belt preceded the proclamation of a new Khan. In such a context, the message of the belt changes, and the act of untying the belt at the election ceremony can be seen as a symbol of lib liberation from the obligation of submission and obedience to the former ruler. Although the sources are silent about the return of the belt to its previous position, the tying of the belt by the participants in the ceremony after the enthronement of the new chosen, one should be regarded as a girding for service for the new Khan. An Iranian miniature of the um, 14th century from this album depicted the sense of the Mongol Khan presenting belts to a group of subjects. According to the ritual reproduced in the miniature, the subject of the Mongol Khan received the belt on their knees, which presumably visualized and strengthened the function of the belt as a sign of submission and obedience. The Mongolian investment of the rulers of the conquered territories, as mentioned above, indicate their involvement in the imperial power structure. The rope made visible the delegation of power to them, while the belt symbolized their dependence on the Mongol Khans. In other words, in the Mongolian state, the granting of power meant the simultaneous subordination of the recipient of the gift to the donor. Thus, in Mongolian imperial costume, the rope and belt represent an integral sign system. The semantic connection between the Mongolian rope and the belt is expressed in the basis of the content of the plot described by Enuveri about Barakshin Khatun's proposal to Khan Kulagu to take power over the possession of Sarta. Quotation. She entered into relations with Kulaku, the son of Tului, sent him an arrow without feathers and kaftan without a belt, and sent an ambassador to him to say, There are no more arrows in the quiver, and the bow is left without a bow. Come to take the kingdom. The fact that rope without a belt, as well as an arrow without feathers, a quiver without arrows, and an armor without a bow, denotated semantic incompleteness is beyond doubt. But at the same time, the allegorical meaning of rope without a belt 
is not excluded, which corresponds to the direct proposal to reign but not to serve. And conclusion, the practice of the presentation of honorary robes developed in the Mongol Empire on the basis of the cultural and political heritage of the peoples conquered by the Mongols. The information contained in written sources about the grounds for presenting crops of honor and the state status they implied testifies to a stable social structure, as well as to the hierarchical change that occurred by the inclusion of new groups in the cultural space of the empire. As a result of prestigious distribution, the vertical of power was reproduced and relations of suzerainty were demonstrated. The adoption of honorary robes and putting on them the external manifestation of the obedience of the gifted to the giver, a way of visualizing, sorry, visualizing dependent relationship. At the same time, honorary clothes make the receipt of power implemented in various form. The right to rule over the granted territory, control of the army of different levels, transferring the of submissions to a new master, and so on. As a materialized form of politics, Robes of honor made visual ties based on reciprocity and relations of superiority and dependence, and in a hidden from contained the idea of the spread of the Khan's power from the center to the periphery. Thank you very much for your attention.